Hello, everybody. Let's talk about how reactions change behavior when we change the temperature. Uh, thus far, we could only work at the reference temperature, which is 298K. And there's some reactions that happen at 298K, but you know from experience that a, a lot of things actually occur at uh, much warmer temperatures, or at least a lot of industrial reactions occur at much warmer temperatures. So we need to find a way to deal with that. All right, here's how this is going to work. You recall our equation for the equilibrium condition for a reaction looks like this. We have that uh, pi of activities, and there might be temperature kind of embedded in activity, but uh, we know uh, how to deal with uh, activity at different temperatures, right? Because we've chosen an activity model and that model either does or does not account for the impact of temperature. And uh, we can just go back a few chapters and figure that out. So that part is set. And uh, it might seem when you look over at this side of the equation over here, that the only thing you need to worry about is this temperature. And so how hard could that be? We just plug a different temperature in. Aha, you're wrong. Okay, we need to work out what's going on with this delta G, because delta G uh, changes uh, with temperature. And in fact, it changes with temperature in the following way, as shown uh, in this equation right here. So notice we keep the delta G sitting over RT, because why not? We're, it always shows up that way, so let's just treat that as one unit. And so this is our delta G uh, at the temperature of our reaction. That's what that means. And so if we look at what's on the right hand side of this equation, and if you want to follow along, uh, this is in Elliott and Lyra, this is equation 17.26, if you want to get a look at that. Um, what we see on the right hand side is two pieces. Uh, the first piece is a piece we are very comfortable with, this thing we know how to do. That's delta G as calculated from adding up all the stuff at the back of the book. Ooh, I'm in highlighter. That was unexpected. Uh, so we say, so this is from based on delta G, G of formation. Uh, and R is R and T is 298. Notice uh, your book, instead of writing reference out, it writes just R here. Um, I'm writing out reference this time anyway to help avoid confusion uh, because uh, since we're talking about reactions, it seems like R might be reaction, but R is not reaction, R is reference. That's why I wrote it out here to help us remember that. Okay, so we can cope uh, with this far right uh, part of the equation. So what the heck is this thing? Well, this thing is uh, where our big temperature adjustment comes from. Um, and so what we would do is um, we're really looking at the energy side of things here, right? Because uh, free energy has both uh, energy, has both enthalpy and free um, and entropy in it. And uh, to do this correction, we really need to concentrate on the enthalpy part. Uh, so we are going to integrate from the reference temperature to our reaction temperature, uh, pretty much delta H. Um, and it's the delta H, you know, you recall, Delta H zero uh, ref is from based on delta H formation. So you calculated this before. You have to sum everything up from the back of the book, and it tells you if you expect this reaction to be exothermic or endothermic. Um, so to make this work, we are going to uh, integrate that from the reference temperature to the <coughs> reaction temperature. And that seems like it's not going to be so bad. And in fact, uh, mathematically, so straight up in terms of like the concept you're thinking of, um, it isn't so bad-ish. So embedded in there is an integration of CPDT. And you're like, oh, I know how to do that. That's no problem. Uh, because, you know, maybe I model CP with the A, B, C, D. 
and uh, just uh, that's uh, nice to integrate because you end up with a t and a t squared, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's all groovy. Uh, the thing about it that is weird and painful and odd um, is the fact that it's CP of what, right? Like, like what? What is this the CP of? Um, you're doing a reaction. There's a bunch of different compounds in here. And in fact, there's compounds that you start with and compounds that you end with, and uh, they're not the same thing. And they may all have different CPs. And the number of moles that you have is not constant as this reaction proceeds either. Uh, so you have to account for the fact that you don't just have one CP. Uh, for this mixture, um, you have a bunch of CPs that should be kind of averaged over uh, the composition. And while this is not hard to understand or hard to do, it is tedious because you've got to work it out uh, for the beginning of your mixture, uh, for the end of your mixture, um, and you have to look at what they call delta A, delta B, delta C, delta D for every compound. And uh, it's just a lot. And so not undoable, but it is the sort of thing, um, and I'm gonna uh, write these two equations out for you here, three, uh, 3.46. Um, this is why Uh, God gave us computers. We are going to um, use the computer for this sort of thing. Not because you can't do it by hand, but because when uh, you do this, it involves so many terms that you have to be so accurate with that if you try and do it kind of written out on a piece of paper, uh, stuck into your calculator, you are almost certain to uh, leave something out. And so it's not worth it. We're going to run screaming to the computer begging for help. And uh, this is why, excuse me, the awesome people who wrote your textbook made a little calculator for this. It's called KCalc, and it does this calculation for you. Um, you should also know that uh, obviously HiSys can do this calculation for you uh, as well, um, but it's much easier for you to see and control what's going on if you use KCalc. So for the full, most accurate version of the equation, I'm going to recommend we use this tool, and I made a separate little video on using that tool that um, I hope you will watch and practice along. Next up, how to do the shortcut version of this.